What's up everyone, welcome back to more Reddit stories about crazy people, Karens, and all that kind of stuff. Hope you're all doing awesome today, be sure to subscribe for more Reddit content if you haven't already, and let's get into today's stories. New hire misses most of the first three weeks of work, then uses me as a reference. Let's call her Karen, just because it fits. She came in and applied for a job, and when I looked at her resume and application, I realized she knew some of my old neighborhood friends and schoolmates. She interviewed well, so I gave her a job. Told her to be in Monday at 9 a.m. Monday morning, she is not in. She no calls, no shows. Tuesday, no call, no show. I had now written her off. Wednesday, she shows up about noon. Claims she was in her basement Sunday night and her brother was working out, and he accidentally knocked her out during his intense workout. She claimed her doctor told her she had a concussion and she should stay home for a couple days. She had no doctor's note, no marks on her head, but thinking her story was so off the wall it could almost be true, I let her come to work the next day. She worked Thursday and Friday. We paid at the end of the week and I gave her a check Friday. I also did not deduct the days she missed. She came to me and asked about the full paycheck. I told her we were a family business and realized people had lives outside work. We tried to make sure people knew they were appreciated and tried to take care of our people. She teared up and thanked me and said we could count on her. She worked the full next week, did okay. She seemed to fit in. Seemed. The third week, she showed up Monday, but Tuesday was another no-show, no-call. We did not hear from her for over two weeks. When she finally showed up, her story was the stuff of legends. She claimed her husband had forged divorce papers a couple years previous. Thinking she was divorced, she moved back into her parents' house. She claimed her ex-husband was at her parents' house when she got home the last night she worked. He told her he made up the divorce and the paperwork was phony, so they were still married and he wanted to get back together. She claims she refused and he kidnapped her. She said it took her until a couple days ago to get away from him. She wanted to come into work the next day. She did not call the police and he wasn't arrested. There was nothing in the papers or on the news about any of this. She was not hurt, thank God. She asked if I believed her. I did not, but told her that I really needed someone I could count on coming in reliably every day. I gave her a paycheck for one week. She had worked one day, and told her I wished her good luck. I had already replaced her, and her replacement was one of the best employees we ever had. The next month I come in to a phone message that someone from X company called for a reference for Karen. As my secretary is handing me the message, she's laughing at the look on my face. I asked if she was kidding. She said she was not. She said she got a call from a man saying he was the owner of a company in the area and he asked about Karen. Then my secretary asked if she could listen in on the call. She then goes and gets my partner and tells him I am going to call and give Karen a reference. Now he is in my office laughing too. I call the guy and we make some small talk. I tell him what we do and he tells me what he wants Karen to do for him. I tactfully avoided answering any of his questions about Karen directly. I think he was beginning to suspect something. Remember folks, employers can get in a ton of trouble for bad references. He finally asked my opinion of Karen, and what I said was, If you can get Karen to work for you, you will be very lucky. He heard what I said and how I said it. He repeated that back to me exactly as I said it. All my words were the right ones. It was my tone and intonation that got my point across. He thanked me and hung up. Karen comes into the office a couple days later. She looks mad but is trying to be pleasant. She told me she is having trouble finding a job and mentioned she has used me as a reference. She wanted to know if anyone from X company has called me. She knew they did. She told me she really wants the job at X company. I told her I had been called and that I told the guy he'd be lucky to get her to work for him. My secretary confirmed that's what I told him. She told her she was right next to me during the whole conversation. Karen smiled and thanked me and headed to the door. She said she wondered why she was having so much trouble getting a job. She asked if she could continue to use me for a reference, and I told her absolutely. I also told her I'd tell everyone the same thing that any employer would be lucky if they can get you to work for them. She walked away smiling, happy, and clueless. Honestly, the fact that she actually used this employer as a reference shows that she's not just a bad worker, but she was also completely delusional about thinking she was a good worker. 
I mean, come on, who in their right mind would actually think that an employer would give you a good reference? As if there was even anything good to say at all, after you only showed up like 10% of the time. And when you do show up, you give some hilariously ridiculous tales about why you missed work. And the way OP handled it is honestly just great. Maintained his professionalism and avoided badmouthing an ex-employee, while still getting the point across. And when OP told Karen what he actually said, technically he wasn't even lying. But still, you would think that she would get the hint though, right? Apparently not. You're working under my license. I don't need you double-checking my work. Okay. I'm a lab technician, and there's this licensed scientist who is practically hated by everyone but our manager and some supervisor that handles lab safety. These two are the only reason he hasn't been fired yet. This guy is so arrogant he makes a point to tell every lab tech he comes across that he's a senior scientist with a license, so work should only be ran when he's physically watching us. Meanwhile, other senior scientists tell us to call them if we need help. It goes without saying that the techs make a point to avoid assisting Arrogant Asshole whenever possible. One day I was scheduled to work with Arrogant and another scientist, Good Guy. There were two tests that needed to be ran. Arrogant had partially set up the machine for one of the tests when I started checking the pipetting tips to make sure they were all the same size. Recently someone had accidentally loaded a set of tips with different sizes onto the machine. Fortunately, Good Guy caught it before the machine started and prevented a crash. Arrogant did not like what I was doing, so he stopped me and said, What are you doing? You're working under my license. If you set up the machine, then I would be the one double-checking your work. Since I'm the one setting it up, I don't need you double-checking my work. Had he not essentially told me to F off, I was going to replace one of the 50 microliter tip racks he had loaded, because I noticed a few 300 microliter tips were mixed in. Instead, I placed the tips back and walked away, while giving the biggest eye roll possible. I began helping Good Guy with the second test instead, who had just returned from a meeting and was happy to have me assisting. About 10 minutes later, there was a loud crunch and an oh sh** from Arrogant. As predicted, when the machine picked up the mixed tip rack, it pushed so far down that the tips snapped into pieces and caused the reagents to splash all over the machine's deck. Almost a hundred samples were contaminated and two hours of work was lost. Arrogant got written up for the lost work and got yelled at by two supervisors. Other techs and I still refuse to help him to this day. Reporting my fiancé and her lover to the FBI for credit card fraud. Not long ago, I was engaged. My girlfriend seemed like someone you could build a life with. She was beautiful, intelligent, admired and respected by everyone who knew her. She always had good ideas and instincts when it came to making money. She was the girl of my dreams, and I genuinely wanted to spend my whole life with her. After two years together, I proposed, and we planned to get married in Bali in 2025. In March of this year, I noticed something off about her behavior. She started coming home four to five hours late, often with excuses that didn't add up. I also noticed she put a privacy screen on her phone, making it impossible to see what she was doing on the phone. She began leaving the house looking like a diva, with impeccable makeup, dyeing her hair more frequently and changing her hairstyle. She had always been well-groomed, but these changes seemed excessive, like something only models and stars do. I felt uneasy and the feeling wouldn't go away. So I put an air tag in her car to track where she was when she was late. The same day I did this, I saw she was far from home, and her car was parked in a rough area. I drove like a madman until I found her car and waited for her to return. After several hours, she came out of a house with a man. Despite my anger, I remained calm and decided to talk to her when we got home. I let her leave first so she wouldn't see me and then headed home myself. When I got home, I found her in the kitchen making dinner. Although I was furious during the drive, I tried my best to stay calm during our conversation. After several hours of listening to her excuses, tears, and lies, she finally told me the truth. She had started a relationship with that guy. He was involved in stealing credit card data from online store customers and convinced her to create an OnlyFans account and other adult live streaming sites. Together they used stolen credit cards to fund her model accounts and split the profits. At my insistence, she showed me her OnlyFans and other accounts. After that, I quietly went to the couch and fell asleep. 
The next day, I contacted the police and made a report to the FBI, explaining what my fiancé was doing. I didn't tell her anything. I pretended to be upset but passive, and she believed me. Nothing happened for more than a week until one day, police officers knocked on our door and arrested her. One month later, I got a call from her, who is currently out on bail. She accused me of ruining her life, saying I overreacted and should have just broken up with her instead of getting her arrested. Refusing to let my brother's family move in after he evicted me years ago. Several years ago, I, 28 female, was living with my older brother, Tom, 37, and his wife, Karen, 34. I had just graduated from college, had a pretty bad job at the time, and was struggling to make ends meet. Tom had a house with a guest room, and he told me I could stay with them for a while until I got back on my feet. I was beyond grateful, and I made sure to help out however I could, cooking, cleaning, buying groceries when I could afford it. Fast forward about six months. I finally landed a decent job and was able to contribute more financially. I was on my way to becoming independent. Around this time, Karen got pregnant, but then Karen started dropping subtle hints that they needed more space for the baby. The hints soon turned into direct conversations about how they needed the guest room for a nursery. Tom assured me that I could stay until I found a new place, but Karen was clearly becoming more agitated by the day. Then one afternoon, I came home from work to find all my stuff packed up and sitting in the hallway. Tom told me that Karen had decided they needed me out ASAP. No discussion, no warning. He tried to soften the blow by saying they'd help me with a security deposit on a new place, but it was humiliating and hurtful. I ended up couch surfing for a couple of months until I could afford a small studio apartment. It was a really tough time for me, both emotionally and financially. I'll never forget the feeling of being thrown out of my own brother's house like that. Fast forward to now. Tom's life has taken a turn. His business went under and they're having financial issues. Last week he called me out of the blue, sounding desperate. They're being evicted from their house and have nowhere to go. He asked if he, Karen, and their two kids could stay with me for a few months while they get back on their feet. Here's the thing. I'm doing much better now. I have a good job, a nice apartment, and I've been saving for a house. I can technically accommodate them, but the thought of letting them move in after what they did to me years ago just doesn't sit right. I told Tom I needed to think about it, and ever since he's been sending me guilt-trippy texts about how family is supposed to be there for each other, and how they have nowhere else to go. Even my parents have gotten involved, saying I should let them stay with me because they're family, and what happened years ago is in the past. But here's the kicker. Karen hasn't apologized once for how they treated me. Not a word. She didn't even acknowledge it when we spoke on the phone. It's like they expect me to just forget about it and welcome them with open arms. I'm torn. Part of me feels like I should help because they are my family. But another part of me feels like this is karmic justice. Alright guys, that's it for today's stories. Thank you for watching, I appreciate it. And as usual, if you enjoyed, be sure to drop a like and subscribe for more Reddit content. So I'm out of here, take care and I'll see you next time.